Uh, welcome, welcome, one and all. Um, are you going to settle down or not? Okay. Cool. Right. Uh, I suppose uh, a quick review. So where are we? We have got our virtual machine up and running. Um, and uh, even though I've got these installed. Uh, it doesn't look particularly promising. Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, so, well, so we've got um, our uh, system basically up and running. Um, we've got this vagrant file, which is invoking our bootstrap script to set up our server and last week one of the things we did was we made sure that this concourse port uh, that's set up in our vagrant file is propagated through directly to our bootstrap server uh, passed as an environment variable uh, so Uh, the bootstrap server script uh, basically sources the three other shell scripts we'd set up, concourse, docker, standard packages, and then it invokes various functions that are defined by those um, libraries. Um, the reason we did it that way uh, is really so that uh, a, a little bit later, we'll look at writing um, Bash script tests. And one of the things we want to do is actually write tests for all of these things. Now, this is a bit bass backwards. Um, you have to excuse me, I'm a bit dry this evening for some reason. Um, yeah, this is a bit backwards. Normally, I would advocate writing the tests first. Um, and we'll talk about why um probably later on this evening uh but basically <clears throat> um yeah we've got these scripts that do very distinct things um we're going to replace them in the fullness of time with a proper configuration management system but they'll do for now so what have we actually set up we've set up two two things um and they're related uh we've set up docker and we've set up uh, the configuration. Good. We've set up the continuous integration server, uh, which is going to be the thing, the doer of things is the best way to describe it. Uh, so the doer of things is going to um, run a set of tasks in a particular sequence. Uh, and that will constitute the pipeline through which we will push our code. Our code is going to be um, a set of, in this instance, is going to be a set of Sphinx documents or a set of Markdown documents um, in Markdown or restructured text. We'll talk about that in a second because we're going to move on to that shortly. And they are going to be passed through our Sphinx system, which is going to take those, mangle them, and produce our documentation set. Um, why are we doing documentation? Well, first of all, we're going to need documentation as we begin to document our system. Uh, but secondly, um, it's sort of at the forefront of my thinking in terms of where we go next. So as we're learning programming, one of the skills which I think is missed in a lot of courses is how to document your code and the importance of documenting your code as you go. And that's exactly what Sphinx is good for. Um, we're going to be writing a lot of bash scripts and we're going to be writing some Python scripts. Um, and 
in each case, we want to be able to generate documentation so that the people who come after us can see what we've done and how it all works. Um, and to do that, we're going to use Sphinx. Now, Sphinx is more useful than just documenting our source code. Um, it can actually be used to write long form documents as well. Um, and so we'll look at that option. And we'll look at how to customize Sphinx to do exactly what we want it to do. Um, so that's what we're going to move on today. And we're going to start looking at Sphinx through the eyes of the Docker image, which has been provided by the Sphinx Doc project. Uh, I should not watch this live. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no problem. <clears throat> I mean, to be honest, we're going to be starting work on uh, something relatively new. So although you'll have missed out on all the setup, Medera, um, uh, yeah, you've missed out on all the setup, but we're actually moving on to sort of phase two now. So uh, everything we're covering from this point onwards will be new. Uh, Sphinx is going to be new in part to me. I have used it a couple of times, but it, I've not set it up from scratch like we're doing. So that'll be interesting. Um, and Concourse I've used several times and I quite like um, because it is a sort of bare bones system. But we haven't sort of set any of that up yet. So if you want to stick around, feel free, because uh, we are actually going to cover it from scratch. In fact, let's do that right now. Uh, you can see I'm sitting in this scratch directory. Um, uh, and we created this last week, um, but it's not really very important. So let's uh, get rid of that. Mm. Okay. Uh, oops. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm, I must have created it. Mm. I can't imagine why I created it with sudo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's um oh I know why it was, it's because we created it with Docker. No, uh, never mind. Okay, so let's start again. Uh so we're gonna make the directory scratch. And we're going to CD into that directory. Okay, so we've just got an empty directory. Now if you remember from last week, uh <laughs> If you remember from last week, okay, we were looking at this, okay. Um, this is the Sphinx documentation Docker uh, container. Well, this, this is the image, okay. So for those of you that don't know, Docker. Um, you can think of Docker as two, what, what, uh, what's the best way of describing it? Okay, In, uh, you, you start with a Docker image which is, let's call it the template, okay? Um, and when you invoke that, when you run it, you create a container. Now, there's nothing magical about containers, by the way. Everyone goes on about this, but they're, they're quite simple beasts. Okay, all a container is, is it's a set of, um, constraints placed around a running process or processes. Now you'll note that um, many people will tell you, oh, you should run one process per container. And I would say, generally speaking, I would agree with that. There are good reasons to run more than one. So for example, um, a fairly common scenario is when people run uh, an email service and they will simply package it up in a single container. Now, email is a fairly complicated beast. Um, so you'll find that you'll have a lot of processes all running within the same container. <clears throat> and that's perfectly okay. It's really not... I'll tell you what it's very similar to. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with Linux, uh, you'll know about um, Chirut environments. And it's very similar to that as a, in concept. Okay, the idea is you've got a sort of jail uh, uh, around your process. 
Um, and that jail says things like, you are allowed access to um, the, you know, certain parts of the networking subsystem. You're allowed a certain amount of CPU. You're allowed a certain amount of memory. Um, you're not allowed to go wandering around my system, basically. Okay, and that's all the container is. Now, there's a couple of other things. Um, the file system associated with the container uh, uh, is special. Um, it consists of a series of effectively write, uh, oh, sorry, effectively read only layers. Um, so when we build, I'll tell you what, it's easier to show than it is to describe. So let's um, start with this. Okay. So this is running the quick start. Okay, so this command um, basically says, right, I want you to run uh, this, oops, I want you to run this, oh, come on, Mark. Mm. That's better. I want you to run this container. Uh, I want you to map this directory on my file system, which you'll notice currently is nonsense as far as we're concerned. So let's just quickly change that. And we're going to use a bit of um, Unix magic. So what have I just done? Okay. This is saying I want to run the command pwt, which prints the current working directory. So this scratch directory, the directory I'm currently in. Okay, so I want to run the command pwd um, in a subshell. That's what these brackets mean. Uh, and I want that value to be put here in the command line. Okay. And this minus V says, I want you to take this directory, for a working directory, and I want you to map it into the container as this directory. Okay, so within the directory, we'd see, we will see a slash docs. And then I want you to run this command, Sphinx quick start. Okay, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna run effectively a command, a Sphinx command, in this case, quick start, inside the container. Let's just do it, and then I'll show you uh, uh, how to look at what's just happened. So, do I want separate build directories? And so, yes, I do. Uh, let's call it scratch. And we won't bother with a release English. So that's it. We're done. Okay. So once that's done, that's created these directories. Okay, so why are they here? They're here because if you remember up here, we mapped. Okay, now by default, Sphinx quick start will write into this slash docs directory an initial setup for Sphinx. But because we'd mapped that directory onto our host, in the current directory, the print work directory to PWD directory. Okay, so if I do um, PWD here, you'll see that that's the directory we're currently in. Okay, um, and it's created this build directory, a batch file, a make file, and source. Right, so going back up here. We can now run something like, actually, do you know what? I don't know whether this has actually got a shell in it. Let's try. Oh, it does. There we go. Okay, so what we've done now is we've now run that same image. Okay. But this time, instead of running the quick start, we've actually run the shell command. So what we're, what's happened here is we're now sitting at the shell command. Okay.
and you can see that we're in the uh, docs directory. Okay, this one. All right, and we're looking at these files, make file build make.bat.source. And these are exactly the same files as we've got here. All right. So if I were to do something like touch test.txt in here, okay, you can see we've created test.txt. And if I now exit this, okay, and there it is. So you can see how this works, right? We've mapped those two directories. Okay, so one's inside the pro inside the container and one's outside the container, but they're actually mounted. Uh, uh, so they're mounted such that anything we do inside the container is reflected outside the container. Uh, while we're here, uh, this RM means that when we're finished, when, the, when this command, whatever command we put on the end here, so the shell in this case, or the, the quick start when we were working with it before, here, when that's finished, the container is removed. Okay, so it's completely destroyed. So oops. Yes. Mm. Yep. Mm. Okay. So these are the these containers are for our build system. They've got nothing to do with Sphinx. Uh, but if I do docker I do docker images, you can see here that we've got this sphinx sphinx image. Okay, and that is what we're referring to here. Now there's a few other things. Um, one of the one of the questions people always ask is how do I look at what is going on with Docker? Um, and one of the things you can do if you do um, uh, Docker minus H, the universal tool of everyone who is who deals with anything. Okay, uh, actually it's probably worth covering that. If you're not familiar with um, uh, the Linux command line, okay, uh, there are a, a couple of things you really ought to know. First one is uh, minus H on a command line almost always will get you something like this, which is just the usage. Okay, um, you can see here I'm being told off. Okay, so it's telling me minus H has been decremented, uh, deprecated. In other words, it's no longer to be used and I should be using the long form minus minus help okay so uh, technically if I do this mm -hmm, type it correctly uh, okay it won't whine about me using the wrong command now um, but yeah minus h or indeed minus minus help in many commands um, will get you this usage command um, as will for example, typing an invalid command. Generally speaking, most commands will output a usage. So that's one way of getting help, and that gets you kind of the help um, at the most superficial level. Another way is with man. Okay, so man docker will get you everything you need to know about docker. Okay, and spacebar. We'll let you scroll through this, okay, and then queue to quit. Um, another one which sometimes is available is info, and it's not available on here. Okay, so I'd have to install info, but that's another way potentially of getting help. But man will almost always work. Uh, minus H or minus minus help will almost always work. Uh, so they're worth, uh, yeah, even if you simple commands like this, uh, ls, ls minus h, 
Mm, doesn't work. So and that's because it's a built-in man ls though. Gets me everything I could possibly want to know about the list command. Uh, yeah, so it's worth knowing those two things because they're your sort of get out of jail free card for almost everything. And with things like Docker, um, you'll often find that because there are subcommands like this, okay, so you've got all these subcommands. The one we just used was this one, run. Okay, run a command in a new container. All right, compare that to exec, which runs a command in a running container. Okay, so if I do, uh, oh, it's not oh, this is it's ps. Um, and so if I do this, we've got two running containers. Okay, concourse and Postgres. Concourse is the one that we're really interested in um, for our build system. So I can do something like uh, uh, Docker. Um, Concourse CI dash one. Uh, and I can go slash bin slash sa. Okay, and now I can see inside that container. And you can see in this instance, it's put me at the root of the container. Okay, so that's we can use exec in this instance because this container is actually running. We have to use run. We have to use run in the case of the. Uh, uh, Sphinx one, okay, we use run because this image is not a running container, okay? So this will actually run the container and then execute the shell inside it. Okay. So, um... Right, okay, that was a bit rambly and we sort of went off on a tangent with help, but it's worth knowing about help because it's a sort of Swiss army knife. Okay, so we've got these files. Now, if I look at uh, look at this, okay, you can see we've got an issue. You remember when I tried to delete the scratch directory, we got all sorts of errors, and this is the reason. Okay, these files and directories have been created as the root user. Okay. Sorry, mate. Um, why? Well, that's because by default, um, the Docker uh, will invoke. Uh, okay, this is where it gets a bit complicated. The, the, the Docker engine will actually invoke the uh, containers as the root user unless otherwise specified. OK, and because of that, when the quick start runs, it will actually create the files inside the container as the root user. And because of that, they're created on my file system as the root user. Which is mildly irritating. Mm -hmm. But there you go. Mm -hmm. Um, right, uh, I think um, I, I tend to use a different thing to do this, but I'm, I'm trying not to install too much in, in here. Um, what was the name of the the uh, image Sphinx something wrong SPH. There we go. Ah, good. Right. Okay. So we can see here uh, information about the uh, the image that we've downloaded. You can see this isn't very helpful 
generally speaking. Okay, it's got lots of information about where it came from and how it was built. So we can go here to see uh, where the Docker file came from uh, and things like that. But this is all very much sort of technical internal um, Docker stuff. Yeah. And that's not very interesting. There is a tool. Um, and now I'm trying to remember what it's called. Let's just have a and this is where Google is your friend. Uh, uh, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, somewhere. Uh, that's not very helpful. Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, just, mm. Maybe it's in one of the weird lists. No, no, don't care. Don't care. Don't care. No, 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 no. No, no, none of that's interesting. Um, This is actually quite good. Actually, that's one you might want to read. Okay. Uh, uh, do, 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 Oh, come on. What was that tool called? Oh, this is slightly irritating. There's a there's a tool. Um That basically allows you to look at the structure of a Docker image just looked at
Well, that's irritating, isn't it? Oh, well. it wasn't really that important. I just thought it would be interesting. Dive. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Yes, it is. Thank you. I was racking my brains and there it was. Thanks, Pads off. Um, yes. Thank you. God, that would have been, you know, it's one of those things where you're looking at something and you think. This is a great tool. Um, it will basically let you look at uh, the internal structure of uh, an image and see how it was put together. So if we uh, actually let's just install it and see what happens. Um, all right, here we go. Um, it's, it is probably sitting on my Mac actually. Um, uh, here we go. So we're on Debian, so we have to do this. Now this is something that we can do. <laughs> we can do with a degree of impunity because this is a development environment. Uh, it's not something we really ought to be doing on a production system, but right, so we should now. Uh, what was it called? Sphinx? Is it going to do it? No, I'm going to have to do it. Really? I'm going to have to do it the long way around. Um, Docker. Images. There we go. Okay, so this is our Sphinx um, Docker image. Um, and the main thing to look at up here in the top left um, is uh, this, this is the, uh, these are the commands. Okay, and each command will generate um, a layer within our system. Uh, so if we go down, uh, now then, this is going to be interesting. Here we go. Right, so right at the bottom here, it installs, um, uh, use, uses pip to install Sphinx. Okay. Then we install, uh, oh, that's interesting. Oh. Uh, Eight. Right. Okay. So th this work directory you can see had zero bytes, but what it did was it ma made the the default directory into slash docs, which is the reason why when we shelled into this, we ended up in slash docs. Whereas when we shelled into the um, concourse one, we ended up at the root. Uh, and then Sorry, I'm reading this backwards. So this is coming, this is the base, the bottom. Uh, then we do this, uh, then we update pip, then we install Sphinx. That makes more sense. Um, anyway, uh, it, it doesn't really matter very much, but I thought that would be interesting. If you, if you actually get this tool, you can then look at whatever images you're looking at. It's not really relevant to what we're doing, but it's kind of a cool tool. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry, that was a bit of an aside as well. Mm, let's get rid of dive. Okay, so having gone completely off course, uh, let's now also... Now remember... Mm, 
when we're doing anything in here, we, we, we've got to bear in mind that we're still dealing with everything as root. Uh, so if we want to get rid of that text, uh, that list directory, we have to do sudo in order to make sure we can get rid of it. Right. Or we have to go into the, into the container and get rid of it. Right. Okay. Oh, the other thing we can do is we can actually now make this our own, uh, ready for um, getting it into a pipeline. But before we do that, let's talk about pipelines. <laughs> I know I'm jumping around a bit, but yeah. Oh, that's just the way my brain works, I'm afraid. Okay. So we've established that we've got uh, Sphinx in here. Uh, we've generated the basic pages, okay? And if we look at those basic pages, um, all we've got in here at the moment that's interesting is this part here. And all this is, is it's gonna build the most basic of websites. So how do we build it? Right, if you remember, Uh. Right, so up here, we just run the Sphinx, Sphinx, Sphinx Quick Start. I mean, if we want to build it, we do make and then hmm, HTML, which is the default. Okay, and I see it's going to be like that, yeah. It'll be uppercase or something like that. Uh, well, hey, this is why you should just read the bloody documents. Like HTML, I thought so. Have I? Oh, <laughs> uh, it helps you feel the right directory when you do it. Uh, right, okay, so what happened there? Right, let's it, it's probably worth explaining because that was a cock up that actually led to a teaching. Point. Okay, so here you see what I've done. Uh, I've run the same command, but because I'm not in the scratch directory, when it's mapped this directory, okay, it's mapped my home directory, which is the directory I was in, to this slash docs. Okay, and because in my home directory, Okay, there is no, uh, there's nothing here. There's no make file or anything like that. But when I attempted to run make, it said, no, there's no rule. And that's understandable because there's no make file. Okay, it's looking for this. It's looking for a make file. Uh, ooh, is it worth, is it worth me describing make files very quickly? Mm, I, think, I think this one's fairly big out. Oh, it's tiny. Excellent. Good. Um, right. Uh, make and make files for those that don't know. Um, make is uh, the sort of old man of build systems, um, but he's still very widely used and with good reason because it's extremely good at what it does. Uh, in this particular instance, all we're really interested in um well okay we're interested in a lot of things but we're, what we're really interested in is this final target down here uh okay um which is the one that's actually going to do the build so basically anything at all is going to run this fix sphinx build and it's going to look for the source directory build it into the build directory and providing the options well the options are basically going to be nothing because we're not passing any in okay sphinx build is the command sphinx build unless we tell it otherwise but again in our instructions we're saying that you know we're not bothering okay the source directory is going to be source which is this fella here which is the default if you run the quick start the build directory is going to be build which is this fella here okay uh, 
Uh, so, so that's that variable there and that variable there. Sphinx options, okay, is going to be default to empty or whatever we provide it. Okay. Uh, and then this is going to be HTML. And that's it. That's all it does. Uh, make files can get really very, very complicated. If you don't know about make files and you're going to be dealing with mm, almost anything really, but um, if you're going to be dealing with a lot of build systems, the, this is a better than 50 50 chance you're going to come across a make file. Um, so it's worth learning at least the basics of how to read them. You don't necessarily have to know how to write them, write them, write them in DevOps, but you certainly need to be able to read them in order to understand what they're doing um, because you are in, inevitably going to have problems with them um, and you'll need to understand what they're doing. Uh, do you really need to have the skills to write them? Mm, that depends. Um, it depends on, on exactly what your organization expects of its DevOps people. Um, I've, I've written make files uh, in the past, but I think that really was when I, when I was more in the uh, dev side of my career. Um, I don't remember really. I mean, I've, I've edited them and I've debugged them, but I've never written them from scratch for most of my career. I don't, I don't recall writing them from scratch, but they're worth knowing about. Um, in 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 modern uh, web in, web dev environments, you're you're generally going to come across other systems like uh, Maven or. Uh, if you're working with JavaScript, there's things like Grunt and stuff like that. Um, uh, what other ones are there? Yarn is a popular one uh, with that kind of work with Node and JavaScript. Um, I don't know. There, there's an endless number of the damn things. Um, and you're in, I mean, they all do basically the same thing, uh, which is they try to work out the structure of the system that you're building and then using that they create sort of dependency trees and then based on that they work out what needs to be rebuilt and only will build the elements that need to be rebuilt um like i said they all they all do basically the same thing but they do it in slightly different ways uh, right uh make dot bat by the way uh, is really uh, if you are on a, a Windows environment, um, we're not, so we ignore it. Um, okay, sorry, uh, I got sidetracked there, didn't I? Um, right, so we're going to run make HTML, but we're going to do it in the correct directory this time. And okay, so now it's done the build. If I do the tree, uh, you can see under the build directory, which was originally empty. We've not now got a whole load of stuff. Okay, we've got loads of CSS, we've got JavaScript, we've got HTML, okay, all sorts of stuff. Um, most of this you don't need to worry too much about, but what it is, is it's the generated website from these source files. Okay. Uh, and it's using the default uh, theme, which is Alabaster. Uh, so how do we view it? Well, uh, the way I did it last week, last week was I just copied it into the Vagrant directory, uh, which if you remember, um, is actually mapped back to the host. Uh, which means that we can go and uh, uh, I don't know whether it's going to remember this from last week. Um, there we go. Da, da, da. 
okay and so that's the website which is generated from it okay so th th this all this nonsense here is just the path to where our um, virtual machine is okay so you can see it, there's nothing here really okay okay so all we've got so far Bear with me. Oh, come on then, connect. Okay. Oh, huh. Oops, we have a Wi Fi connection, I suppose. Okay, more painful than it needed to be, but never mind. Okay, so what have we got so far? Okay, ignoring all of the gubbins that we haven't discussed this week, setting up virtual machine and so on, let's just talk about Sphinx and uh, Docker. So we have uh, a Docker image uh, called Sphinx. What's it called? Sphinx Doc something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Uh, so we've got a. It's called Sphinx Doc Slash Sphinx. Okay, so this is the image. Okay, and when we run the docker run command, okay, that takes that image and it creates a container, which is the container is the running version of the image. Okay, and it will give it it will give it a name. Okay, we don't need to worry too much what the name is because we remove it as soon as it finishes now within that there is a slash doc directory okay and that doc directory is mapped onto our scratch directory in this case okay so everything under this scratch directory is under this doc directory inside the container we then run the command which is installed inside this container called um, make HTML. Okay, and that runs this make file. Which we just looked at. OK, and that make file will then build out the contents of the build directory. OK, so that produces slash build. 
okay, with all these gubbins. Uh, and because slash build is on the slash dock, that gets written back to this build directory. And that's the core of what we're going to be doing next. Oh, somehow, mate, you got hair in your throat. Mm. Okay, so that's how we've got a Docker image that will do some magic, right? So now let's talk about how we put that into a continuous integration system. Right, now we have installed as part of our virtual machine, uh, we've installed this um, concourse system. And you remember last week we went through all of the magic. I'm not, I'm not going to cover it in detail. Okay, but we went through all of the magic to get that up and running. Uh, and me. I put it on 9081 or did I put it on 9090? I put it on 9081. Okay, so you can log into this is as test test. And you can see here it's telling me we've got no pipeline set. Now um, we won't go into a great deal of detail about concourse, but just understand this. There's a uh, concourse divides the world up. Uh, by teams, okay, and the default team is called main, okay, and within those teams, we will create a series of uh, uh, a pipeline, and a pipeline is just a set of transformations. So we get inputs from one end, it goes through a series of transformations, and then we get an output at the other end. Now, Let's talk about pipelines. Mm -mm -mm. Let's talk about them in, pri in principle. OK, so we're not talking about concourse particularly here. This could be done with GitHub Actions. It could be done with GitLab, um, CI, whatever that is called. Uh, Travis CI is another one. They all work basically the same way. OK, and that is you'll have a series of resources at one end. Uh, quite commonly, there'll be a Git repository. But they don't have to be. There are there are all sorts of resources potentially. Okay, so we have let's call them resources at one end. Okay, and they go into a series of tasks. Okay, so let's call it task one, task two. I think I could write. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then task N. Okay, so however many we're going to have. And they come out the other end and they get put into resources at this end. Okay. And these tasks can be anything we want them to be. Okay, any transformation we can imagine. And in between these tasks, you'll often have sort of intermediate resources. Uh, in order that the information can be passed from one task to the next. Okay, so each task, if you look at it, each task basically has got resources in and resources out. Okay, so what are these tasks? Well, these tasks are Docker containers. Okay, so our task will be the Sphinx container. OK, and that will sit here. And that's that's the magic, right? So it will take inputs coming in. So it will take whatever our source code is and it will write it out to whatever we whatever we tell it to. OK. Um, now. What's the objective here?
The objective is this. Our CI pipeline okay, is basically going to consist of uh, a workflow where a developer does some work, whatever that is, okay, and he commits that to our version control system, okay, which most commonly nowadays is Git of some description. Okay. Um, now, when I say commits it, um, hmm, okay, we're going to get into Git country soon. Uh, okay, so he commits it locally, and then he pushes that up to, let's say, GitHub. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll make it clear that this is GitHub for now. You're going to be a pain, aren't you? OK, now, as soon as he does that, we want to automatically trigger the next stage, which is to feed into our pipeline. OK, so our pipeline will immediately start to run task one through to task whatever. OK, and it will produce an output. And this is where we get into um, the first sort of design decision you have to make when you're creating these pipelines. Are you going to go for uh, continuous deployment or are you going to go for continuous delivery or continuous release? Let's, let's make it distinct. Okay, if you work in an organization where you're perfectly happy that your automation system is clear enough and robust enough that as soon as a developer commits something into your repository, provided it builds, passes all the tests, uh, and you know goes through test environments or whatever, okay, provided you're happy that all of that passes, it can be immediately deployed, then oh, good for you. You're in one of the sort of top percentile organizations uh, because what that means is that every time a developer completes a piece of work they can just commit it into the repository and it will immediately be released into a live environment okay that is a continuous deployment model where a commit results in a deployment to a real live environment a production environment okay Most organizations are not quite that ambitious. Uh, most organizations will have a continuous release um, pipeline, by which I mean when a developer commits the change, uh, the, um, the, the, the tasks of building it and testing it and so on will continue. And then they get to the end and basically you get the big thumbs up where it says, yes, everything works fine. Um, at which point uh, you can say, OK, this version of our system is ready to be released into production. OK. Uh, you may even be more cautious than that. You may say this version of our um, product, our system, is ready to be released into staging environment or into some sort of pre-production environment. Um, but the point is that at, at every pass through this system, you are basically certifying your system as being ready to be deployed. Okay, um, So you may not deploy that particular version of it. You may say, no, we'll leave it for another day. You know, more developers do their commits. Each of those go through the pipeline. Each of those results in a system that, in theory, could be deployed. Okay? In other words, they're all ready to be released. They are in a releasable state. Then you can have another pipeline, which could be triggered manually, for example, by you know, AN other, the release manager, the, the, the product manager, whoever is in charge of, of controlling the release. Okay, And they say, OK, I know because I'm confident in my pipeline leading up to this point, my continuous integration pipeline, okay, I'm confident in the release product being good. I've now got enough 
that I can release it into my production environment. So I push it into the production pipeline and it then does the deployment. Okay. So you get an automated deployment from that point forward into your production environment. These are the two sort of principal models. The first one says, no, we are going to just release everything. You know, a developer does a correction to a typo in a help file, commits that, it gets released. Uh, developer creates a completely new feature, and releases that, it goes into the live production environment straight away. Okay. Now, there's more to it than that, but in essence, that's what we're aiming for. In, in, a, in a perfect world, that's the way our system would be released. Uh, but many organizations are not that confident uh, and they want to have this sort of checkpoint where they say, no, we, we want to be able to say, OK, we've got you know a day's worth of changes or a week's worth of changes. And we will then have a scheduled period during which we'll do the deployment. Now, this is often the sign of a badly architected system, by the way, because if you're not able to do your releases, on a live system, there's a very good chance that you've got your architecture wrong uh, and you have to schedule a time for releases. Uh, and I've, I've been in that situation ugh, more times than I care. Um, yeah, uh, but, but designing systems for live updates is, is, is not something to be taken lightly. And in actual fact, this brings me on to one of my bugbears. Um, what, one of the things that grinds my gears is... Okay, there is this principle in DevOps, uh, which currently has the sort of shift left idea. Okay, and the idea is that if you think of your DevOps as a process, for the, uh, you know, from ideation, somebody comes up with a requirement, all the way through to delivery. Um, the idea is that all of the stuff that used to be traditionally done at the end of the process, testing, quality assurance and so on, we want to shift all of that earlier in the life cycle. Um, and that's the idea of shift left, okay? This idea that you work from left to right and therefore we shift left, okay? Um, I've always been an advocate, uh, even before DevOps was really a thing and we were dealing with you know, things like configuration management um, and, and you know deployment issues uh, in operations. Um, and it always used to upset me that projects always thought about the delivery part of their system right at the very end of the process, which is frankly absurd. Um, and it always, always leads to problems, OK, because developers will develop all this stuff and they basically then go, OK, now we've got to deliver it. And you go, OK, fine. The first time you deliver it. It's just a big pain in the ass because, you know, you've got to do all of this stuff to build out your environment. OK, we've got infrastructure of code. OK, great. You know, uh, we still got to do all this delivery stuff. The second time I've got to deliver it is worse because now it's like jumping on a moving train. OK, because our system's live. People are using it. And now I have to deliver it. And unless you've really thought this through, what you end up with is... The only way to do this is on you know, a Sunday evening when very few people are using our system and the poor, poor deployment time has to come in and you have to shut the system down, do your deployment, bring it up, test it. You know, it, it was just horrible and frankly, still too common. Ugh. But there are all sorts of ways of solving this problem. Um, you know, we used to build multi-leg systems where you'd have, you know, basically your system was divided into two legs, two halves. So you could take one half down and build it, update it, and then you could swap over and then bring the second leg up. <laughs> that was the old way of doing it. Uh, nowadays, you've got things like um, uh, 
microservices and you know, of, you know containerized systems that allow you to effectively do updates in a live environment. Um, but again, you can't just do these things. You know, they, they are incredibly complicated. People think, oh, yeah, microservices, that'll solve the problem. Unless you're very careful about the way you build and develop your microservices, um, you're going to create a, a whole world of pain for yourself. Okay, it's not just a case of, oh, stick it in a Docker of, and, you know, that's the problem solved. It just isn't. Okay, there's a whole raft of problems that come with doing things that way. Um, and unless you are aware of them, you're going to create a whole world of pain for yourself. Sorry. Rant over. Okay, let's get back to where we were. <laughs> okay, so what we are going to do, uh, uh, we are going to, uh, oh, am I still, I don't think I'm actually still live. Uh, let's, There we go. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Having had my cathartic little rant, um, let's get back to the problem in hand. Okay. So what we are going to do then is we're going to take this code that we just uh, created with our um, uh, Sphinx image. Okay. And we're going to put it into a repository uh, ready for doing our build. Okay. Then we're going to write a concourse pipeline, which will take that GitHub and produce a website, okay? Which is the what we're doing at the moment in this uh, build directory, okay? Okay, so we want to take all of this. Now, let's think about how we're going to deploy this. <clears throat> We're going to deploy this uh, into um, uh, into a web server, okay? Because the way the way we're doing it at the moment, by you know popping it around and accessing it as a series of files, that's fine as long as we're doing development. But obviously, what we really want is we want an environment where you know all the users in our organization can get, get hold of it. Okay, and in order to get that, we want an environment where we can run a build, uh, run a, a web server. So, our target environment is going to need a web server, and we're going to need a way of deploying this onto that web server. And there are a whole load of ways we can do this. Okay, so. Uh, which order do we take this in? Okay, let's go back to... Right, so uh, let's just assume that our first task is going to be the one that does the build. Okay, so this is going to do the make HTML. So the output of that is going to be the build directory. Okay, and that build directory is going to be inside a container in our pipeline. One way we could do this is we could take that build directory and deploy it straight away from this task. Okay. Uh, another way we could do it is we could say, no, what we will do is we will take that build directory and we'll put it into... Let's say a zip file. We're actually going to put it into a tarball, but we'll, we'll put it into a zip file. Okay. So the thing that's going to be produced out of here, okay, is going to be, let's call it site.zip. Okay. Um, and that is going to get put into our artifact repo. Okay. What's an artifact repository? Well, if you think of um, uh, Git for binary, sorry, 
Okay, it's basically a place where we can put anything that is a product of our build uh, in a controlled environment. Okay, we could in fact put it into Git, um, but let's just call it an artifact repository for now. Okay, so we put it into there and we associate with it things like um, its version number, version 1.0. Now, our downstream activities, possibly another pipeline, okay, can take the artifact repository as uh, an input resource, okay, and we can have a task called deploy website, okay, and that can, for example, Take the latest version of site.zip okay, and actually physically deploy that onto our infrastructure um, into our into our web server. Okay, so we've now got two pipelines. Okay, if you like, we've got the CI pipeline, the build pipeline, okay, and we've got the deploy pipeline. Okay. Or we could have put this task here and actually had the deployment just as a carried on thing. We would still create this uh, zip file though, okay? Because that is our baseline as it were. That's the thing we've produced, okay? And we can then deploy it. Why would we do that? Well, the main reason would be things like if the deploy went wrong for some reason, okay? Or if we had to roll back the deploy to a previous version, rather than having to go back and actually rebuild everything all over again, we can just go back to the artifact repository and say, well, give me what it looked like, you know, at version one, and we'll just run the deploy part of the pipeline and actually just redeploy it. So it's not, a, it, it's quite a good idea to have these artifact repositories and you'll discover that as you get more and more complex systems where you've got you know multiple moving parts then the artifact repository becomes essential because you know you've got you know say six projects uh, one might be building a front end another one might be developing you know an application layer for some business logic somewhere another one is developing some you know standalone application or your or your um, mobile app or whatever and all of those things fit together in a sense into a system but each of them produces artifacts <laughs> oh <laughs> that was loud uh each of those produces artifacts um which go into our artifact repository for later use and if you want to see an artifact repository at work that's exactly what we've been using uh when we've done things like um Uh, that's probably a really bad example, actually. Um, when we do things like this, okay, okay, these things that we installed, Git, Vim, and Tree, have all been fetched from artifact repositories. Okay, um, all we're going to do is create our own. Okie dokie. Right. Okay, let's take this one step at a time. Um, the first thing we're going to do is create our pipeline. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to create a CI directory for our continuous integration. Okay, and I'm going to create in here um, two directories. Uh, we're going to create um, uh, one for pipeline or pipelines, okay, and we're going to create another one which is going to contain our tasks, which are the specifications for um, the sort of low level stuff, okay, and we're going to use um, concourse. Okay, so this is the concourse documentation, uh, and this will basically tell you how to write um, 
your pipelines. Okay, so if we look at the basics, uh, you can see it uses YAML. Uh, if you don't like YAML, you're probably in the wrong career. Uh, if you don't know what YAML is, oh, you lucky people, because I'm going to tell you. YAML is yet another markup language. Um, it is uh, I, I, I would argue it's it's simpler to read than JSON, uh, which is another way of representing data structures. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who disagree with me on that, um, but they're wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, I think YAML is fairly straightforward to read. Um, and it really consists of sort of key value pairs. And that's that's basically it. OK, uh, there's a bit more to it than that. But broadly speaking, that's what it amounts to. So. Uh, I won't go through this line by line. You can read this yourself. It's on uh, the Concourse CI org website. Um, what all we're really interested in uh, reading through all of this is the basic format. OK, and you can see the basic format is. P, which can't contain spaces. Um, colon. And then a value. OK, now. You can see here uh, you can either use simple values like string. Uh, you can have numbers. Um, you can put quotes around strings, in which case the quotes aren't included. They're just delimiters. OK, or you can type strings on a single line without any quotes. Uh, there are some reasons why you don't want to do that, but it's valid. Uh, you can type multi-line values by using the bar, uh, the pipe on your keyboard, okay, which basically says the next lines indented okay, by convention, generally indented by two spaces, um, and everything up to either the next line which isn't indented or a blank line will be considered to be the value after the pipe. You can do arrays. Uh, you can do them in two ways. You can do them like this with the square brackets um, and comma separated values. Or you can do it like this. And this is the more common way um, by putting a dash uh, followed by a space. And value okay um, or you can do effectively nested um, objects okay if you're familiar with Python it's like dictionaries okay so again um, indented by spaces but this time we're putting another key colon value and we can create arbitrarily complex data structures using these very simple tools okay um, if you want to see the details of YAML, um, and there are many, uh, let me see, YAMLs. And you go for a fairly recent one. There we go. And as you can see, it can get pretty complicated. But don't be put off. In essence, it's extremely simple. OK, all of this is really just dealing with the subtleties of, of how it's structured. Um, the long and the short of it is it's fairly straightforward. It's just key value pairs. But again, it's worth having a skim through the documentation just to familiarize yourself. This is generally a truth as well. This is another um, top tip, as it were. Whenever I'm looking at documentation, um, and this is true of almost any documentation I look at, 
first thing I do is I'll have a quick skim through it, um, particularly the contents, because um, it gives me a rough idea of what the tool or the, you know, the um, in this case, the, the markup language, what it can do. Uh, and I find that having that in my head means that whenever I encounter a problem and I think to myself, well, hang on a minute, uh, the first thing that occurs to me is, well, surely it must be able to do this. Um, if I've had a quick look through it, then I, I find that in my brain, your mileage may vary, um, you know, it, it will sort of tickle that little thing at the back of your mind. And you, you think, I know there's a way of doing this. And so you then go back to the documentation and find out exactly how you do it. OK, and this works almost universally. That as long as I've got a rough idea of what the thing can do, um, I can just read the documentation. And this brings us on to another truth of DevOps. And this is, this is one of those sort of professional secrets that aren't a secret. And that is uh, new people coming into this um, will look at this and go, there's just so much to learn. And the answer is, yeah, there is. There is a lot to learn. And even now, after 30 odd years, you know, I still look at stuff and think, good, but there's so much crap, you know, that I have to know and I have to learn, I have to figure out. And the more you learn, the more you realize there's so much you don't know. Um, but that's OK, because when I started, <laughs> I want to sound like a crusty old fart now, when I started, your resources were... Uh, some news groups, email groups, IRC, um, the manual, and I mean a physical paper manual. Um, often uh, these manuals that we used to get would have, you know, like addenda that were inserted at the beginning. They'd be, they'd be binders and they'd have addenda in the beginning. So not only did you have to read the bloody manual, you had to actually read all the addenda and check those out and then read the appendices. And, uh, you know, and if, if all else failed, you might be able to find somebody to help you on one of the news groups or, or on Internet Relay chat, something like that. Nine times out of ten, though, it was just a question of roll your bloody sleeves up and get stuck in there. This is why uh, things like um, VMS and Unix would, oh, they were a godsend because they had online manuals and online, you know, you've, you've just seen how you get the manual. Um, yeah, it's like bloody witchcraft when you're coming from environments that don't have these things. Um, it, it was just wonderful, wonderful. Nowadays, of course, Google's a thing, um, or in my case, DuckDuckGo. Um, but the point is, search engines are a thing, and uh, your job has become more difficult in the sense that there's more to know but infinitely easier in that there are you know massive resources to yeah you know, if you're going to learn for example python um there are a million training courses and videos on youtube and things like that that for you to look at and for you to practice with okay um, I often find people who say, oh, oh, yeah, are there any good projects I can do? And the answer to that invariably on things like the DevOps, uh, r slash DevOps on Reddit, for example, is pick a problem. You know, just find something that you do that you, it irritates you. I mean, uh, let's take some examples in, in just my own private life. OK, I, I've had um, solar panels fitted. And. Uh, there are there are two systems that I use. One uh, is a thing called Solcast, which is a solar forecasting tool online, um, which is way cool, by the way. Uh, and another one is the uh, energy management system for the solar panels uh, also writes to a cloud service. OK, now, when I was buying the system, one of the key th features was, does this thing have an API? And the answer is, yes, it does. So there you go. I've now got a perfectly good you know, Python project. Uh, I can go, I can get information from the API. Uh, I mean, it's got an app, but where's the fun in using that? I can get the information from the API. I can put that into my own local database. And uh, I can then take that information and I can upload it to Solcast because it's got a, an AI system, a machine learning system 
on the back end, which means that it improves your solar forecast based on the actual measurement compared to what it had predicted. There you go. Perfectly good exercise. Okay. And if you want to put that into a series of services that run on your machine or into a Kubernetes instance, to have that run you know, once an hour, once a day, whatever, uh, in order to update the information. Great. I mean, these are all really simple things that you can uh, say really simple. They are relatively simple, little utilities. OK, um, if you don't have solar panels. Fair enough. But there will be a million other things like, you know, uh, oh, I want something to display the weather forecast. Rather than going to uh, the internet and going, oh, is there something to show me the weather forecast? Uh, what you want to do is say, OK, I'll find a weather service with an API and I'll write a tool to do it myself. Um, why not? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be writing a lot of YAML files. OK, why don't I just write a YAML validator? Uh, and of course, a lot of people would look at that and go uh, and say, why would I do that? You know, there are already tools out there to do all these things. And the answer is, look, you want something to learn to program. What better way uh, than implementing something that already exists? Uh, it's, it, it's something that you, A, know is actually possible. B, you can probably find examples online. And C, it's something that you can do for yourself uh, in order to improve your programming skills. So there are endless ways of doing this. Oh, I was talking about YAML. Sorry, I went off on one again, didn't I? Um, yes, so YAML. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to write a YAML file. Um, now, uh, so here we go. Um, we've, we've got the, uh, the basics okay, of um, YAML outlined on their website. Uh, but what we really want to do is we want to develop a pipeline. So here is a basic pipeline. A, pi a pipeline consists of one or more jobs, and each job consists of a plan, which is one or more tasks, which interact, as we've discussed, with one or more resources. OK, so the first thing in most pipelines, OK, the first thing you'll find is a set of resources like this. OK, so let us um, let's let's set this up. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to GitHub. Uh, I'm going to use GitHub for no better reason than it's there. Uh, and I'm not actually signed in. Uh, okay. Yeah, that one. Uh, okay. Uh, you right. Bear with me one second while I go and just check this out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, let's give me the bloody valley before so I can get on. And device, blah, 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 verification code. Huh? Okay. Uh, right. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to create a, um, yeah, I'll just create a, a scratch project. So let's just call it and call it scratch. Scratch is available. That's big of you. Okay, so this is just a 
And uh, I'll make it public. Um, uh, I'm not going to add a README file because I'm going to I'm going to upload what we've got here. Okay, so now we've got instructions on how to set it all up. So if we go back over here and go back into Scratch. Okay, now you remember one of the problems we've got is everything is currently root. So I'm going to chain everything. And this is where... Blah, blah, blah. Uh, of course, it's not permitted because I'm an idiot and I didn't sudo it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's looking better. Uh, so I'm going to set up a Git repository here. And. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. So I'm going to. Um, okay, I'm going to be naughty now and just do get. Uh, uh, no, I don't want to do get, do I? Because I don't want the build directory. Uh, okay, so let's just have a quick. Let's have a quick look. Uh, yeah, I don't really want to add the build directory, um, but I do want to add. Uh, lake, uh, lake file in the source, source. Okay, so we've now got everything added. Uh, the next thing I want to do is tie this up with my uh, remote repository. Okay, uh, because I'm own idle. Copy and paste that. Now, <clears throat> uh, now we're going to run into the issue that um, if I do a push now, uh, it's going to need my username and password. And I think I'm just going to change that. Uh, all right. Hello. Uh, uh, this is where I'm trying desperately to remember the order of these. Right, now then, um, of course now uh, I'm going to have to go back and because I don't have my SSH directory in here, uh, so just for now, um, I can't remember whether this will let me do this or not. Ooh, that's ugly. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Cannot load file. Ooh, that's not nice. Mm. Ooh. 
Oh, it's being positively moved now, isn't it? Right. right, I know I know why this has happened. Uh, All of these, by the way. Uh, oops. Okay. All of those, all of these errors up here, by the way, were caused by the fact that uh, the shell, um, the uh, the directory in which this um, project sits is on uh, an external drive, and Apple have managed to completely screw the pooch. Uh, and when my Mac shuts down, uh, external drives are not necessarily properly disconnected and then reconnected when you restart if you sleep. Uh, and so what happens is the shell loses track of the directory. So you have to sort of CD back into it in order to reconnect it. So that all of those errors were due to the fact that the shell had lost track of the actual directory on external drive yeah. so bizarrely you do cd dot the shell then recognizes it again and you're up and running so mm, anyway uh, oh god uh, right uh, and it's got uh, oh that's interesting so it's got everything across but Have I screwed it up? Home Vagrant SSH, that's where I copied it to, isn't it? Oh, okay. Okay, I've been a dumbass, as usual. Mm. So I want to move everything in dot SSH. Mm. Oh, come on. Yay! Uh, okay, we're up and running. So that config should now work. Uh, uh, and we get up. Blah, 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 sort of everything. Good. Okay. Right, okay, I went through an awful lot there quite quickly. Um, all, all I've done is, all, all of this nonsense here, okay, all, all of this stuff here is all of my private keys for SSH. Um, and uh, the way SSH works in this environment is... Oh, how am I going to explain this? Right, if you set up your Git remote, uh, if you set your Git remote up to, to use the Git protocol, by default, okay, it's going to use um, SSH to do the connection. Now, um, SSH, for those of you unfamiliar, is secure shell, which is a bit misleading because what it really is, is a secure tunnel um, between two machines. Uh, think of it like a, uh, a single machine to single machine VPN. Yeah? And um, it's, uh, it uses public key encryption. So you've got a private key and a public key. Right? Um, the private key is known only to you. And that's what is in all of these things here. Okay, so GitHub, there's a directory that in, in there, there are a couple of files public key and a private key. So the private key is the one that's going to be used on this end to initiate contact with GitHub at this address. Um, and that is going to then look up the, uh, the public key, which I've associated with the Salty Vagrant account on GitHub. Okay, uh, make the secure connection, and then I can actually do the, the uploads. That makes sense? I don't, uh, uh, if, if, if somebody wants me to go through the details of 
SSH and public key encryption. I guess we can do that on another stream because I don't want to get too distracted. I've already sidetracked too much this evening. Um, okay, so, like me, you really are coughing today, aren't you, mate? And you've got fur in your throat or something. Uh, so we've done, um, yeah, sorry, we've staged everything. So now, and I'm, I'm going to do, do the laziest possible. Um, uh, oops. Initial. Oops. Okay. I'm sure we've all done this. Okay, so we've got everything in our local copy now. And I should be able to do that and ah would not uh, okay this is obviously not looking up my public properly mm, so. oh um okay this is another uh, Uh, it should already actually be set to seven zero zero. It should be. And six four four should be okay. And so we've got salty vagrant keys there. And with host GitHub, it should be using that identity file, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'm slightly puzzled. Anybody can see the obvious mistake I'm making? Because it must be obvious, because... What was the actual error? Oh, the commission could not read the repository. Access rights to the repository exists. Uh, so if I go and uh, uh, Oh, I interesting. Mm. I can't even read from there. 
It's a public repository. I should be able to access it without any. Uh... Okay, let's try doing it this way. Well, at least got the address right. The problem is obviously to do with my SSH keys. I don't think I've changed it enough. I'm pretty sure it's using the correct key. I should be using uh, let's just okay let's simplify this file uh, and we don't need uh, need anything other than that okay And the identity file is GitHub salty vagrant. Which is in there. I'm actually wondering if it was GitHub RSA was the one that I registered. Nah, I wouldn't have made that mistake, surely. I mean, I've been using GitHub with these. So... Oh, oh, it's bloody annoying when this happens. Um, get that github.com permission. I mean, I suppose I could try changing to the other public key file. I'm, I'm pretty sure. That Um. Ah, well, it would appear that the key's wrong, which is a bit of a drag. Uh, 
be that I mean it has been a long, long time since I used GitHub. Okay, right. I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna chicken out. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um Really? And okay. <laughs> right, as I was saying. Get 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 up. I'll do it in GitLab. <laughs> this I know is correctly wired up. So in fact I can create uh I'll not set up a streams group in there. Uh, yes I do. Good. Okay. Um, no, we're not deploying anywhere. Make it public. Don't initialize it. Get the project. Uh, so now we need to get the origin to be Mm-hmm. Helps if you actually say remote. Ooh, bloody ray. Right. Right, so finally mm -hmm. having done battle with GitHub and lost, I shall have to reset my um SSH key on GitHub. I don't know why it's not working. I assume maybe they've invalidated them at some time in the past and it's been so many years since I've used it. Uh Okay, so GitLab. Um, right, so now we've got a repository, right, and it's got our sources and stuff in it, so finally. Uh, now, why did I go through all that trouble? Right. Okay, so uh, we're going to create a pipeline, um, and we'll call it uh, site. Okay, so we're going to create a uh, pipeline called Doxelate, and this is the reason why. Okay, because we're going to start out by creating a resource. Okay, and uh, the only difference is we're not going to call it book. We're going to call it. Um, 
block site and of course the URL. Now in this case we're not going to use SSH. Uh, this is a, a, a public website. If if I was doing this um, for something local, then I would use um, uh, sorry, if I was doing this something private, then obviously I would need to use something like uh, SSH or to use username and password. But because I'm being lazy and because I'm having a bad day, uh, I'm going to do it the easy way and use the public URL. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is going to set up a resource called Docsite. Uh, although I suppose really uh, it would make more sense to call it something like .git, but nah, I'll be bothered. Uh, okay, so we've got our resource. Okay, uh, so the next thing we need in our pipeline is um, at least one uh, task in our job. Okay, so let's start out with uh, jobs. Okay, and we're going to call the first one um, What should we call the first one? Uh, we'll, we'll just call it uh, build Because that's what it's going to do. Okay, and the plan for build Is uh, We're going to Do a get. Okay, so get is Get is one of Concourse's uh, sort of standard um, command, uh, which, which instructs it to actually go to a resource, and uh, it does two things actually. Um, uh, okay, uh, a Concourse resource has got three commands that it can respond to: uh, check, get, and put. Okay, check uh, is generally always run, um, and check uh, will just look to see if there's been any change. So if we and we're we're going to put a trigger on this. So every sixty seconds, on course, we'll ask the GitLab repository um, to do a check. Okay, and that check uh, returns. Uh, the latest commit, basically, uh, in, in, in a Git resource. Um, and it basically says, uh, is, this, is this the same as the one I was expecting to see? If it isn't, then I assume somebody's done a commit, in which case I will then do the get. So it then tells the resource to do a get, okay? And the get uh, then does the, you know, cloning of the repository. Um, and then uh, we're then in a position ready to. Um, what do you want to come up? Uh, we're, we're then in a. We're then in a position to do the build. Um, if you want to look at uh, the way resources work, um, again, their documentation is pretty good, actually. Um, so. Uh, Lose me place. If you go to resources, okay, uh, this actually give you the resource how to write a resource. No, it doesn't. Um, well, actually, actually, that's yeah. This is worth looking at. These are the sort of resources that you can either get or put to. Uh, so you can see here that you can get Ansible playbooks, you can get uh, Artifactory, which is a, one of the artifact management systems. You do Nexus, which is the one. Uh, no, it doesn't have Nexus in there, but uh, nobody cares because we can write our own. Um, that would be a good exercise. Uh, you can go to LastPass if you want to keep your secrets in LastPass. Um, but these, these are fairly simple things to uh, create. Uh, what you need to do is in assets, okay, you'll see you've got check, in and out. Now in is the put and out is the get. Uh, uh, and you can see they're extremely simple wee beasties. 
There we go. Uh, they're just, in this case, they're just um, bash scripts. But you, they can be Python scripts or anything you want. Okay. Uh, the rules the rules are fairly simple about what you must do with them uh, in terms of what, what is expected to be returned. Uh, is it on their how to page? Uh, blah, blah, pipelines, git guys, container images, blah 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 blah. Um, no, interest. Thought there was. Yeah, I told you that it is quite good. It now turns out I can't. Uh... Yeah, there we go. Implementing the reason. There we go. Okay, so this basically tells you everything you need to know about how to structure your uh, resources. It will come as a surprise to no one um, that these eventually get put into a uh, container. Um, but the container must have these scripts so that it, they can be invoked. And that's it. Very simple. Uh, right. So back to our example. Ooh, we're going to do the get. Okay. So now the get, we specify the resource, which in this case is Oxide. Okay. And we're going to say, yes, we want to do a trigger. Okay, and what this does is this, this actually starts the polling process. Okay, so when you do a get on a resource, there are two types. Okay, and, and uh, simplistically, a get is providing the in, input, inputs. Okay the task um, so uh, this is going to do a uh, git clone from that uri into a directory uh, called docsite um, and the trigger turns it into a const a constant poll okay um, otherwise it won't trigger uh, it won't run the build when somebody commits a new version um, if we don't put this trigger in uh, so there's that, and uh, now the interesting part. Uh, we're going to put together a task. Okay, so, and this is where, um, yeah, you're not helping, mate. Uh, yeah, so this is where we actually define our task. So we give it a name. So um, uh, I suppose we should distinguish it from the build, really, but. Um, Sorry, from the uh, job. Oh, you do know how to make me comfortable. Um, so let's say uh, this is going to be uh, our make, just because I need to give it a name. And we're going to give it a file to run. Okay, and that file is going to be um, in CI. Oops, CI. I slash okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to write a script, and that script is going to be called uh, Sphinx. Okay. Um, Now, now the question then becomes, well, hang on a minute. How does it know where to get that CI from? Uh, I've said CI scripts, Sphinx build, but I haven't said where that CI is. Now, you might think, oh, well, it's just the directory you know, from the pipeline. 
But the answer is no, 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 no. It has to be a resource. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find another resource. And this time we're going to call it uh, site uh, CI. And it's going to be it again. Now I could have, I could have, to be fair, okay, I could have put the CI in with the docsite stuff. I don't want to do that. Yeah, well, okay. This is going to be another one of those decisions you have to make uh, about where you put this stuff. So here's the, here's the thing. Okay. In our repository at the moment, uh, we basically have uh, the source, okay, which is um, our source directory with, and that's going to be the thing which is going to build our document site. You want to go outside? Mm. Time is it? Time is long. Okay, guys, uh, just give me two minutes. I'm just going to let the dog out, and then and then I'll come back. OK, uh, sorry about that. Um, yes, we need to make a decision about where we put this stuff. So in here, uh, we have um, the source directory, which is where we're going to put our code or our, our, our um, markup for our website. OK, and then we've got uh, at the higher level, uh, we've got the make file which actually runs the Sphinx. So the question now is, where do we put this CI? And I've just changed my mind while I've been thinking about it. We're going to put it in the same place. So escape. What I'm going to do is this CI directory is now going to be within Oxide. OK, so we're going to use the same repository and we're going to store a CI directory uh, which is going to contain all of our our build system okay all right so if I just write that out and then I'm going to have to uh, move that CI into the scratch directory uh, so that Uh, I can now do um, okay. So now um, the, the uh, all of the continuous integration system is now going to be uh, uh, in the same project repository. 
What I was saying before was you, you have to make a decision when you're structuring these things about where you put the, the CI code compared to the project. And there's an argument both ways. So the, the way we're doing it here um, makes sense if the pipeline and the tasks uh, are specific to this project. If, however, they're not specific to this project, if they're more generic, uh, then you probably want to have a different repository for your CI code, uh, yeah, your pipelines, tasks, and so on, Okay, and then have individual repositories for the parts of your system. Um, and then you would ha have to define the CI as one of the resources. Uh, and uh, I can sort of show, uh, do I want to go through the arse break of showing this? Mm. Is it some, oh, hang on, I can show you over here. Come on, it's much, it's much easier if I show you up here. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, so as an example, um, if we go back to um, projects, now then, no, something completely different, projects, um, yeah. Um, right, so this is this is the CI system for um, the thing that publishes my website, um, and this is actually separated out. And the reason it's separated out is because this applies to more than one uh, sub project. Okay, so this is, if you like, the pipeline and tasks which build the system. Um, and that consists of articles which go into a sort of blog format, uh, books which are sort of book layout, um, and they are then combined uh, to produce a website, and that website is then published. So all of that pipeline uh, is actually... Oops, that figures... And is this actually running? And no. Uh, go to Nginx. Oh, that's working. Ah, oh, okay. Just a bit of lag. Um, Again, uh, unfortunately, this is running a virtual machine, which suffers the same problem as the other one, which is that it's running on the external drive, and Mac tends to screw with it. Anyway, what I was saying is, yeah, so this is the pipeline that's described by that external CI, okay? And because these repositories, these book repositories and the image repositories and so on, are separate projects, they're separate um, repositories, uh, I took the decision that the CI, continuous integration element, should be kept separate um, because it's uh, it, it makes sense in that context um, because all of this stuff, um, all the scripts and the tasks and so on, share a lot in common. So, um, how can I put it? Uh, so, so in this instance, the continuous integration element has got more cohesion as a single thing than it does if I were to associate it with any individual um, document repository. Uh, now, I could, of course, have said, no, 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 articles, books, images, all of that source material is all in one big repository, okay? And then it, it would have then made sense to have the CI in that repository as well. Um, The reason I didn't do it that way uh, is by breaking them out into sub repositories like this. If I make a commit, uh, for example, to articles, um, then that can trigger that part of the build. If it was all in one repository, every time I triggered it, then it would trigger the build of the entire system again. Um, so, yeah, it was just easier. So, again, these are all, these are all sort of, mm. get rid of that. 
It's just embarrassing. Um, so these are all the sort of decisions you have to make when you're designing your system about, you know, what makes sense to go together and what makes sense as separate things. Uh, if you read, um, like, uh, Google famously have a mono repo, uh, which is a bit misleading, um, but broadly speaking, what it means is that, that they consider their code base to be a single monolith even though it's actually made up of many, many projects. Um, so they have one code repository. Uh, it, from what I've read of it, it's a kind of misleading. Uh, but for better or worse, that's the way they refer to it. Would I come down on the side of a mono repo for you know, have your entire organization in a single repository? Uh, no. Um, no, I wouldn't, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, in many organizations, there are good reasons for separating things out into different repositories, not least of which is uh, size, because you still need to manage the fact that you, you, know, you can't have your... Int if, your, if your repository gets to gigabytes and gigabytes of data, then it's not practical for developers to have those checked out. Um, and this is where, when, when Google talk about a mono repo, um, they mean that there's a, a single conceptual repository, but in actual fact, developers deal with you know, small parts of it at a time, even though they have access to the whole thing. Um, so yeah, so uh, there are questions of you know, manageability and accessibility um, for developers. Uh, if you're working with developers around the world, you know, it's sometimes quite com complicated to get repositories accessible enough uh, over like you know weak network links and things like that so there's a, there's a lot to think about in that respect um there's also the question of um uh, confidentiality uh, some organizations um because uh, you're working from potentially more than one client there's the question of confidentiality in your development environment uh so having a one repo in that res in that context is yeah, not a great idea uh, because it's it becomes more difficult then to control access to it. Um, whereas having separate repositories, it becomes much easier. Uh, then you've got things like what we've just discussed, which is um, you know if a commit to a repository triggers a build and you're in a mono repo, there's the potential for you know kicking off uh, builds when they're not really wanted and relying on the build system then. To, uh, work out what needs to be rebuilt and what doesn't and again it depends on what you mean by mono repo as well because it's not you know it's not entirely clear that that would necessarily happen if your repo was structured and uh, you know if you think of if you think of a mono repo as a huge git repository then yes that would become a problem but if it's not a massive git repository it's a sort of conceptual repository you're dealing with different things. So yes, uh, which one's right, which one's best, depends on the context. Okay, and again, this is all part and parcel of the job, is making these decisions and designing systems accordingly. And again, coming back to one of my bugbears uh, about the internet, um, if you go on a forum and say, oh, which is the best way of doing it, you, you will invariably end up with, you know, people who say, oh, this is the only way you should do it. And it's like, it's bollocks, of course, because it it's contingent. It depends on, you know, your organization, the specific needs of your organization, the needs of your um, particular project, um, uh, how it interacts with other systems that you've got, like, for example, your build system. So, you know, there, there are no black and white answers generally. There are mushy grey answers at best. And the one thing I would say is this. When you're designing a system, whether it be a build system or whether it be, you know, designing the actual uh, IT system for an organisation or whatever, uh, there is one thing to bear in mind at all times. And that is, it's going to change. And you're going to get it wrong. Um, and 
decisions you make this year, you will look back on in three or four years' time and think, mm, I wish we'd done it a different way. Uh, and after 10 years, you'll be looking back at it and going, oh, we need to change it because there's this new sexy con you know, um, way of doing things. You don't have to go back very far for this to be an issue. Um, you know, containerization and stuff has only become popular relatively recently. Um, before that, it was unheard of. The idea of test-driven development, which frankly is a great idea. Uh, it, takes, it, it takes discipline, but it's a great idea in principle. Um, but again, it's something comparatively new. Um, it's also something uh, I've very rarely seen adopt, you know, implemented effectively. Um, but there it is. And this is all because there's a lot of inertia. You know, it takes time for people to adjust to these new ways of work and, and these new approaches. And because most people are working on legacy systems, and this is something that people seem to miss a lot, most people in, in our industry are working on legacy systems. And that means that even when you get the opportunity to, for example, work on a project which is all containers and Kubernetes or whatever the latest, you know, sexy buzzwords are, you will find that you're still having to deal with a lot of baggage. You know, it's, it's very rare, very rare that you will be able to go into an organization of any size um, that has been around for a a number of years um, where you're not going to have legacy systems to deal with. Um, and I don't mean just having to inter in interface to them. I mean where you're going to have to deal with their build systems. Or, hello, mate. Uh, you're going to have to deal with their build systems and all the bullshit about you know, the fact that they're using old style build systems. They're using make bar still. They're still building stuff in basic C and you know, there's going to be a million and one things. Hello. Uh, yeah, well, if you're going to come up on my knee, I'm going to need the blanket. I'm just going to close the door. All right. Just give me two seconds, guys. I just want to go and close the door. Right. Are you coming up or are you staying down there? Okay, I'll take that as a coming up. Um, oh, you're wet. It ring raining. Uh, where was I? Uh, oh, I was on another one of my old man rants, wasn't I? Uh, right. Uh, getting back to the story in hand. Yes. Okay, so we've made a decision. We've added our CI. Uh, our CI to our dock build project. Uh, so where have we got to? Uh, right, so we're in. Um, so we've got this pipeline uh, ready to go. Um, it doesn't do anything very interesting at the moment because although we've got uh, something coming in, so we've got dock site coming in, okay, and we're going to run it and we're going to do a make. OK, and we're going to run this script to which we haven't written yet. We're about to OK, uh, to do the Sphinx build. Um, and. The thing is that now what we what we'll end up with is in a container within the concourse system will be the build directory. And. Where does it go from there? Uh, the answer is, well, it's going to go nowhere at the moment um, because it's going to be stuck inside uh, a container. 
So what we need to do is we need to put that somewhere uh, in order that it can um, do something useful. So Uh, right, but, okay. Uh, before we do that, let's let's just write this script. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, make a directory called script. Now you might be wondering, as you see here, I created this directory called tasks. Okay, and we've actually specified the task here, um, and that's because you can uh, you can get your tasks from elsewhere. In fact, I might have made a cock up there. Uh, yes, I have. God. Okay, this is what happens when you don't do things for a while and then you try and show people and you realize that you've made a complete ass of yourself. Uh, because this file is not script sphinx build. It is the task. And we'll see why in a minute, because tasks are more complicated. Okay, so let's try that again, shall we? This time we're going to write the task uh, sphinx dash ui and dot yaml and I am Okay, now we're going to define a task. And so if we go to tasks. Okay, so this is how you define a task. And what we're going to see is the first thing we want to tell it uh, is platform which will be Linux, because it's the only one we're dealing with at the moment. As you might imagine, that can be things like, you know, Darwin or Mac OS or Windows. Uh, now we're going to say, uh, right, now, now we want to tell it, OK, we want to use uh, an image resource. And this is going to be the Sphinx image that we want to run. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the this is going to be the image which is used to actually perform the task, and there could be more than one, uh, but we're going to use just the one. Uh, blah, 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 and it's going to be registry uh, okay. and where do we get it from? We get it from. Uh, the repository. Now, uh, this is a bit like um, uh, when you use it on the Docker command line. If you don't specify explicitly another repository, it'll go to GitHub. Uh, so we want uh, Sphinx doc slash Sphinx, was it? Uh, Sphinx talks like, yes, Sphinx. Sphinx. Okay, so that's the repository we want. And uh, do we want a particular tag? Well, yeah, let's let's be well behaved and we'll give it a, an explicit tag. So if we go to Sphinx, doc, does Sphinx doc actually have an explicit tag? And the answer is, well, we could use latest, but we won't. We'll use 5.0.2. Uh, okay, so five foot, foot. Um, now uh, I've said I, I said this uh, maybe last week, maybe it was earlier. Explicit is always better than implicit. Um, now we've been very remiss up till now when we've been building this vagrant file because we haven't really locked anything down. We've always just taken the latest. Uh, 
in a development environment, that's probably okay. Uh, in a production environment, that is very not okay. And when you're building stuff, it's very not okay. Okay, so this is the point at which you really need to be explicit. Um, this, is where, this is when you need to be very explicit. So this is the first point at which we are doing an official build. Okay, so we are saying uh, everything up till now, when we built the Vagrant file and so on, this has all just been building a developer environment. So it doesn't matter particularly which version of Git we're using, you know, which version of Vim you're using, and so on. Um, it very much matters which version of this Sphinx doc Sphinx um, image you're using. Because each one of those images will contain a different version of Sphinx, and that might change the behavior of your build. Okay. Uh, in this case, we're just transforming. Uh, sort of um, transforming some uh, markup into HTML. Okay, but imagine you are compiling a uh, a Rust program or a Go program. Okay, uh, the version of the compiler you use uh, actually becomes very significant because sometimes changes happen to compilers that are not backward compatible. The language can change. Um, good example: Python. Which admittedly is not a compiler, it's semi compiled. Um, but the point is that if you were to write a program now, you would write it in Python 3. Uh, but if you were to write it five years ago, you'd probably write it in Python 2. And they're quite distinct languages. There's a lot of things in Python 3 that are not backward compatible with Python 2. Um, as a consequence, when you specified which Python resource to use, um, you would specify Python 3. Interestingly, because Sphinx is actually a Python-based system, uh, that would apply here as well. Um, you, you know, um, the Sphinx in here will be running on Python 3. Uh, it's perfectly feasible, although I don't know because I'm, I'm not going to bother looking, but the, the if you if you went back in history through the Sphinx doc versions, you'll find one eventually that was not Python three. It would be Python two. Uh, okay, so that's the first thing. Okay, now that is a bit like the uh, get resource. Okay, it doesn't really it do much. All it will do is get the image resource into concourse, and this is where we need to make a very very clear distinction. We are running Docker on our virtual machine. Inside that Docker, we are running Concourse. Okay, Concourse itself is um, a container management system. It's a it's an orchestration system, and so it will have its own containers which will not appear uh, on our VM Docker. Okay, there completely separate. So when we run this, it will download and, and get Sphinx.Sphinx into Concourse. That is not the image that we see in our Docker. Okay, if we remove the one from Docker, the build will still work because it's a completely separate system. So that's what this does. Image resource simply gets that from the registry. Okay, now we can specify the inputs and the outputs. So, uh, now we have to be a, a bit careful. Uh, one of the inputs, well, the only input, in fact, okay, is uh, well, it 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 can be uh, now it it can be anything really. Um, Okay, there are inputs and outputs, and we can also map things. So if we go to the example here, and we go into the tasks, we can, we can pick any of these. Okay, and you can see here uh, that we've got like we've got book source as an input, CI as an input. Okay, so these are all the inputs. 
But if I go back to the pipeline that invokes this, so this is the books build. So if I go to the pipeline, go and find the books build task. I suppose if I just did that. Oops. Uh, here we go. Uh, books build. Okay. So, uh, dun, 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 that is uh, what I intended. Um, nothing to do. These are all still resources. And there we go. Rather confusingly, this is what we're actually looking for. Okay. So that, that's the task there. But you can see down here, we have an input mapping. Okay. And what that's doing is it's mapping book source, which is inside the task, to uh, books it, which is the thing which we provided in the plan. So on our plan, uh, pipeline. Okay, so on our plan, what we've got is we've got the task, uh, this make task, okay, and we are providing docsite. So the input, we could just say the input is docsite because that's what we're providing here. Or inside this task element here, we can say, no, no, call docsite something else, but we won't. We'll just call it, we'll just say, okay, now. There's a problem with this, uh, and that is that, of course, Sphinx is expecting docs. Uh, so we are going to have to do an input mapping, okay? Because it expects the input to be uh, called docs. Uh, now then, we need to be a bit calm because uh, we're not, we're not, okay. We have to be a bit careful uh, because although we are going to invoke uh, this repository, although we're invoking it, when we go into this task, books with it, okay, it takes this book source directory, okay, and that gets into the um, uh, this docker image and it then runs this script okay so if I go to script okay let's see build books PDF is one of them okay so you can see the first thing it does here is starts assembling information uh, about where everything is okay so the, although uh, the sphinx container is expecting us to have a volume mounted on box there's no reason why we should because if you remember uh, okay if we don't mount docs we can create docs and put whatever we like in it. So we can take whatever's in doc site and put it into docs. Okay, so we can either move that as the first step in our script, or we can map this to doc directly. The problem with that is that by default, it won't put these input directory. These input directories are actually put in a special place within the repository. Okay. 
No. Okay. Okay. There's several. There's a lot of moving parts going on. Let's let. Okay. Let's break it down. The first thing that's going to happen, okay, is it's going to get this dock site. It's going to clone this repository into a resource area called dock site. You don't have to worry about where that is. It's just in a place called dock site. Then it's going to invoke this task, and it says one of the inputs to this task is that dock site. Okay, so it's going to take that lump of data, and again, you don't have to worry about where it is. It's actually in a volume somewhere. Okay. It's going to take that lump of data and it's going to map it into our task as a directory called docsite. Okay. And it's going to be uh, a subdirectory uh, of our current working directory whenever we invoke a command. All right. So if I. I go down to the woods today. Uh, oops. Um, okay, so, so what we've got so far is uh, the plan is first of all going to get the resource, okay, then it's going to pass that resource to our task, and that resource is going to be called docsite and it's going to contain our sources. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to invoke a script. Okay, so we're going to run a script. Oops. Okay, so this is the next step of what the task is going to do. Okay, so you can see here, okay, we're going to run it, and uh, they're doing, they're running a shell and passing a load of arguments to it. We're going to do it more like this one. We're going to do this where we're just running the script. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be simpler than, than this because we're not passing any variable in. All right. Now, if you remember, if we do run, we're going to run and we're going to say path. Now, uh, we know that our CI system is going to be in Docsite under the CI directory. Okay, and we're going to create a load of scripts. And in this case, we're going to actually call it uh, build. H. Okay, and that, that's basically it. Now, again, we've not specified our output. Um, so, one way we could do this is we could make our outputs the same as our inputs, in which case it would put everything back out to um, the dock site area. Uh, and that would then allow us to have the resource put that back into our repository. We're not going to do that. Uh, but for, for the moment, we're going to ignore the output problem. Okay. Oops. Uh, Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to edit uh, uh, oh, we're already in uh, oh, we? Oops. Uh, Sphinx build and this is going to be basically our standard Okay, so it's going to be a standard sort of script start. Okay, so this but here uh, is this, the sort of form we want to we want to follow. So the first thing that lot. Okay, just put that. Okay, 
So the first thing I want to do then is I want to get the path to that doc site. Okay, so I'm going to actually create a variable. Uh, we're going to create a variable called doc site. Okay, into that variable I'm going to put. Uh, current working directory. Uh, and you'll recognize this from what we did earlier. Uh, and okay. Now th this is a bit it's a bit sort of redundant, um, but I, I think it's worth doing uh, mainly to make our system look a bit cleaner. OK, at the moment, we are just going to be building sort of this one site. OK, and you've got to remember that inside the uh, Sphinx build, um, although the current directory is set to docs, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. We, could, we can set it anywhere. So doc site is perfectly OK. OK, so what we can do is we can actually just go straight into um actually this is another good point uh yeah instead of cd'ing into it it's just as well to do push d okay and i'll explain why um if i want to put this into a function um it's a it's it's a good habit to get into i think uh to do push d uh, which allows me then to do a pop at the end of, of whatever I'm doing, okay, to put me back to where I was. Um, so you do, uh, the push D basically does a change directory, but then stores the current directory on the stack. And then a pop D takes whatever's on top of the stack off and changes my directory to that. Uh, and it's just as well when you do this, I'll show you what I mean. Um, yeah, so over here, you can see when I do build images, the first thing I do is I change to the source directory. And then the last thing, well, almost the last thing, okay, I do a pop to take me out of it again. That way, everything in here I know is in that current directory, but I also know that um, I've always been reset back to a known location. And you can see I do it again here. Okay, so for each each year I find um, in when I'm building the what we're we building, we're building the books, are we? Uh, yeah, building the images. Okay, so the images are sorted into years. So for each year, again, I change directory into the year directory, uh, so I can do the build, and then I pop at the end of it, and then I push again, and I pop again. So I'm always jumping in and out of directories. Um, and this bit here just stops uh, some annoying output um, that is useful when you're doing um, debugging, but extremely irritating in your build output. Because what it does is it just prints to screen the fact that you're changing directories. <clears throat> uh, uh, so that just suppresses that. OK, so we're now in the Docsite directory and all we need to do now is um, uh, run the make. Because if you remember, the make file is actually in this Docsite directory. Yeah. So if I do, um, if I go back to the, the repository that we're dealing with. Uh, um, Yeah. Okay. Right, so this make file, so so this this uh the the doc site directory inside Sphinx, which, which is this this doc site, okay, which is this doc site. Okay, this doc site is the full path which I've now changed into, okay? And that is this directory, which contains our source subdirectory and our make file, 
Okay, and because it contains our make file, I can do this. Okay, and I've okay, so that will actually do the make. Okay, and that's exactly the same as if I'd run make like we did before with the Docker file, and it will build the HTML into the build directory. Okay. So, hopefully, with all that in place, we should now be in a position where you know, we've now got our pipeline defined, and we've got our scripts, and add CI on everything. Yeah. Okay. So, Quick review. We've defined our pipeline. Okay, and our pipeline is extremely simple. All, we, all we're going to do is we're going to get from this repository something and we're going to call it docsite. Uh, actually, that's, that's a bit inaccurate. Okay, we're going to call this resource docsite. Actually, this, shall we change the names to make things a bit clearer? No. No. Screw it. Let's not. <laughs> We're going to have a resource called Docsite. Okay. And that is going to it contain this when we do this get. So this get is the instruction to go and do the clone. Okay. Then we're going to invoke a task. Okay, that task is going to be given the label make when we're looking at it on our website. Okay, and that task is defined in this file. Uh, we, we can actually define tasks within it, but it, it's neater, I think, to keep them separate. So, okay, so CI task links build. All right, so this is our task. So the, the task is what's going to actually run on one of our uh, various worker instances. Okay, uh, um, okay, so pipelines are effectively the orchestration. And this, if you like, is each individual task is a container which can run on our build infrastructure. Okay, so we say, okay, we're looking for a Linux target machine. And I want you to go and get this image from the registry, okay, and put it into a Linux environment. I then want you to take the inputs from Docsite, which is this Docsite here, okay. I want you to take those inputs, and I want you to run this script, okay. And so what this command is basically going to do is, if you recall our our Docker command from earlier. Uh, I suppose it will uh, be simple. Uh, ah, there we go. So if you recall this Docker command from earlier, yeah, it's going to run without this. This minus v here is actually going to mount this docsite directory uh, into the repository, but not as docs. It will be mounted as slash something 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 docsite. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, but instead of running the make HTML, we're going to be running this script, okay? which is part of this doc site. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Not that it really is. Uh, all we've done basically is redo the build. Um, where was I? Yes, so we're running that script. Okay, so we're now going to look at the script. Okay, and the script is a very, very simple wee beastie. All it does basically is run that make HTML command. Okay, but instead of running it in docs, it runs it in docsite. 
the directory that we just created. Okay. Now, why does that work? That works because the, the reason this is done, this map here, is because the default directory that you'll be put into when you're running a command in this image is slash docs. Okay, how do we know that? Well, we know that. Uh, if you remember when we did the dive, um, probably be better if I specified that to be a local copy link. Hey ho. Right. So if you remember when we looked at this, see this work directory here. What what that basically says is that anything subsequent to that will be in slash docs and it will leave it there. All right. So because this doesn't have its own entry point, um, it's gonna go into slash docs. A directory, by the way, which doesn't exist. Yeah. Actually, it might do. Um, uh, I don't actually exist. A whole load of bins. Oh, it does exist. There we go. Okay, so that's the docs directory, which does exist, but we're not using that. Okay. Okay. What we're using is we're using our own directory, doc site. Um, and this is going to change us into that. So, irrespective of anything that the uh, the working directory which we put into. Um, and in actual fact, we would it will uh, will be put into a special directory um, created by Concourse. We don't need to worry too much about it. We can take a look at it though. Uh, interestingly, okay. So let's um, let's just put this away. Um, let's, uh, add. First, uh, version of CI. Okay, and we push that up. Okay, so we've got that in in our repository. It is okay. So we've got everything ready now. So what we need to do now is we need to define our pipeline to concourse. Now to do that, we use fly. Okay, we're going back to our concourse documentation. Uh, we want to set a pipeline. Okay, so in the pipeline documentation, you'll see this command fly set pipeline. And this tells us how to set a pipeline. Now, before we can do anything in, in uh, concourse, we have to uh, log in. Um, so we've already got the fly interface, okay, so if I do mm, fly, uh, rend minus h, okay, you can see here we've got a login command, and uh, so this is the way it works, okay, now, uh, Concourse has the idea of um, targets or teams. Okay, so in our case, uh, the default is main, so the main already it already exists, and the default for this Docker instance, uh, the the demo version, as it were, okay, is it, it's the main target, and its user name is test. And its password is test. Okay, so we have to first log in. So fly simply accesses the uh, the API 
on concourse. We can then, uh, once we've logged in, it will store a token which is provided to it, um, which has a, a very long expiration date. I can't remember what it is. Uh, but there's a, a you know, it, it lasts for a, a while. Um, so we can log in, and then what that means then is whenever we specify the target main, um, we are always going to, uh, every fly command thereafter, we specify target main, which tells it where to get the credentials, uh, this token that we're provided with, which is then provided via the API, which allows us to interact. So if we don't log in, it will complain. Uh, so uh, T and uh, the target is, and I hope I've remembered this correctly, the username is test and the password is test. And I think that's all you need. Uh, uh, oh, really? Unknown. Mm -hmm. Oh, because I've done this completely arse about place. Yeah. Sorry, it's not target. I want team name. And it helps if you actually put the command in, Mark. Are you annoying? There we go. Unknown target main. Oh, ask. What is it called? Oh, a couple of Bibles. It was main. Uh, oh, maybe. Fly. Oh, minus T tutorial, is it? Oh, yeah, you need to provide that. Mm. Yeah. I'll tell you what the problem is, apart from me being a dumbass, um, is uh, the um i i tend to wrap these instructions in uh into scripts uh, so like this Obviously it won't be that long oh, hello mate Yeah. 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 The script's actually on the other virtual machine. You don't. Know. Um, now this will, for you will be probably ninety eighty. Um, uh, me, I think. Um, it is a ninety eighty one, didn't I? Let's try that. Hmm. Oh, that was Okay, now we're now we're now we're getting some. Uh, so now I should be able to get the pipeline. Now you notice I, I have to leave that minus 
T main, because that tells me which target I'm talking about. Uh, where are you? Um, yeah, I want the pipeline. I don't want to... Okay, so we're going to be doing one of these. Uh, so we're going to be doing set pipeline. Dash. Uh, and then we tell it which pipeline we want to set. Okay, and that is going to be, uh, and this is where having everything in that one place. Okay. It's going to be that pipeline. No. It's going to be a pipeline called, uh, let's call it Sphinx. That's fine. And it's config file. It's going to be that one. Okay. Uh, so it's telling me what it's about to do. And it wants me now to confirm it. Okay, so now if I go over here and look at my concourse, uh, uh, it's going to give me a means being missing. Um, um, Okay, so now we've got Sphinx Pipeline, which is what we gave it the name over here uh, when we set the pipeline. It's paused. Here you can see nothing interesting is going on. Run it. No builds. Well, job build. Well, that's not very interesting, is it? Obviously, foobard something. Uh, job build. So that's the build. Which is this horrible grey box. And we're getting docks. So why isn't it getting this? Um, because I would have expected to see a resource here. There should be a there should be a resource upstream from this. Oh, there it is. So there's Docsite, which is a got. And see it's doing the checks. So we've got resource. But it hasn't triggered the build because there's been no change. Let's kick one off. It, because there's no output, it may, it may need us to actually run it manually. Oh! Yeah. Oink. It needed us to kick it off manually, basically because um, because it had never been run before. So what's what it telling us? Cloning, blah blah blah. Yeah, add first version. So it's done the clone. Then it runs the make and bang, exploded. Oz. Our task configuration was not found. If I misspelt it in the tut. Build. 
Ah, uh, you see, this is what happens. Uh, put task and not tasks. Uh. And so fly. Uh, no, we don't want fly. We want login. And fly. CI tasks. No. So pipeline. Okay, and so tasks. Okay, now it add my pipeline book. It is push. Right. Hopefully, pick off automatically. Where is it? Now? Why didn't it start that way? Oh, it did. There it is. Again. Oh. <laughs> okay. I changed the CI, but what I didn't do is I didn't set the pipeline again. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the mistake was okay. I changed, uh, I, I changed it, and I committed back to the uh, repository. That caused a change to be detected over here, um, and the build was then restarted. Okay, the problem was the change I'd made was actually to the pipeline, not to, for example, the task. And since the pipeline is the thing that has to be set at this end, at the fly end, as it were. Okay, it didn't get changed. So now that it's changed, of course, uh, this won't rerun again until the repository changes, but the repository is not going to change. However, what I can do is I can rerun it or trigger a new build. So let's trigger a new build. Okay, so. Dum, 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 dum. And. British from image. Hang on a minute. That was a direct. That was a direct copy from this. What? What have I done wrong now? Image resource. Uh, Uh, okay. Uh, why is it giving me a time coming? Image resource, registry image, of which. Oh. Uh. Hey. I know these commit messages are not particularly uh, imaginative, um, but
Oh, that's interesting. What did I do wrong then? Wait a second. Why not make that change? Okay. Okay. Well, at least he's taking a bit longer this time. So you can see here it's saying image fetching. So it's bringing down the um, Sphinx dock for the first time because uh, we've actually made it to the task point. Okay, so we've got a worker start process back end error. Great stuff. Failed, uh, unable to start container process. Da 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 da. Permission denied. Well, that sucks. Uh, that's because it's this script has not, I bet it hasn't been chumodded. Uh, and that's the problem because we're not we, because we're not running it through the shell command. Uh, so okay, uh, this is going to be another mere culprit. If I look at this, um, okay, this. Is being run directly, okay? If I'd run it with shell uh, sh or something like that, uh, it would have been okay. Um, if I'd run it as a uh, command, uh, uh. oh come on. Go away. Um, if I do um, mm, helps if you actually play it what you want to do. Mm. Okay. Now, the other puzzle thing is um, why this isn't being kicked off automatically. It should be. Because uh, this 
Should it be kicking this build off? No, no, like I said, because it's it's a it's a polling system. Oh, there we go. Uh, so this is now that 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 has registered the change. The build's now been started. And oh, hey, it worked. But as I said, we've we've got stuff coming in now. The build's working. Excellent. We've got a green light. Okay, this is what we like. Okay, and if we go back to here, okay, green is good. There's only one task. Uh, in this pipeline, hence we've got one big green box. Uh, if you look at like uh, the one from oh for cry now, why are you giving me a right? I don't know why that's been SD. No pun intended. Uh, yeah, so you can see here we've got like one, two, three, four green boxes here. And uh, I don't know. I don't probably need I have to look at the logs later. Uh, I think they're interfering with each other. I'm not sure why. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, these are, these two these two concourses are running in different systems, but I think they're interfering with each other. I'm not entirely sure why. I've never I've never run two look quite like this, so anyway. Yes. Okay. So we're halfway there. Okay. We've got something coming in and we've got a build working, um, but we don't have anything coming out the other side. Okay. So at the moment, this build sort of stops here. Now there is a command. Uh, uh, maybe too late now. Uh, yeah. What I was looking for, but I've got a feeling. Oh, it's uh, so what we need is we need the pipeline job. Uh, so job B. Do I have to specify the whole thing? Probably do. Uh, problem is that it's been a while since this ran, so the chances are it will have been disposed of. Yep. However, if we go in and rerun it, And we want to go into step two. OK, so now you can see we're actually inside the container, which is being managed by concourse. OK, so. And, and this is what I you know, earlier when I was going, oh, blah, 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 when I was talking about the directory instead of it being slash docs. OK, because slash docs will still be there. Okay, so there it is. There's the slash doc, which is defined by the Sphinx documentation image. That this temp build and then this number is constructed by concourse uh, as part of its build setup. Okay, and then when it maps in the doc site as an input, that's where it gets put. Okay, so we CD into that. Um, this is where we performed our build. And so you can see now that we can do uh, we can look at the build okay we've actually got our document in there and that's exactly the same as we would have seen 
if we'd got it created outside somewhere. Uh, so, um, and this won't be installed, I'm sure. Oh, maybe it is. No, it isn't. So, uh, depending on... Uh, what the base operating system of this is, uh, we might be able to do that. No. Oh, uh, well, actually, um, you normally wouldn't do this, of course. But, um, it makes you it makes your containers bigger by doing all this crap okay so there now we can see okay uh, we've got our pipeline definitions now this bit the pipeline is irrelevant because that's only ever used uh, <laughs> oh th thanks reaces um these will be uploaded, by the way, as, as video on demand, if you want to fast forward through them, um, which, frankly, I recommend um, listening, me to waff listening to me waffle for three hours is a bit, a bit boring. But if you put them onto the video on demand, you can sort of skip through the interesting bits. Um, OK, so yes, so, so this pipeline is is um, actually used by the fly commander, but, but keep it in one place. We put it in here. The only bit that is used dynamically uh, is this scripts and this tasks. Uh, and that's because if I look at the this pipeline, whoop, what am I doing? Oh, have I? Uh, oh, come on, just behave yourself. Uh, yeah, so this pipeline goes in, okay, but this is not available until we're inside the container, okay? Once we're inside the container, uh, then the task becomes available under here, uh, okay? And that's where, uh, that's where we find it here, okay? And that's then loaded. And this is a good reason to keep everything separate. If we put the task in the pipeline, and every time we updated the pipeline, it would get put in there. But by having the task outside, when it gets put, when the task needs to be changed, um, it will automatically trigger a rebuild. Uh, whereas, as you saw before, if we change the pipeline and commit it, it triggers a rebuild because the pipeline uh, needs to be changed in the concourse instance to fl through the fly command. The tasks, on the other hand, we can edit those, commit them back into our repository. They trigger a build, and they're actually used then. Yeah. But anyway, uh, and of course that then triggers the script, and the script just does the make, which is what results in our build. Okay, so we're we're sort of we're sort of halfway there. Well, we're we're two thirds of the way there. We've got our inputs coming in. We've got our build being triggered, and you can see it's actually being built because. It's 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 all under this build directory. Okay, so this is the destination as it were. So now what we need to do is we need to get that build directory out and do something interesting with it. So there's a couple of things we can do. Um we could, for example, uh edit the make file uh so that it then goes on to construct um tarball, zip file, whatever. Um in which case we will need to make sure that this thing's got like tar installed. Uh, and it, it, it's unlikely to have. Uh, oh, it does. Well, that's handy. So the base image, uh, unless it was installed when we installed tree, but there's no reason we would have done. Uh, so uh, uh, because we've got tar in the base image, we don't have to create a special image of our own. Cool. Okay, so we could create tar uh of build um so we can do something like uh okay so we can do 
No, okay. Da 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 da. Test lay blocks from store. Help. Mm -hmm. Okay. He actually read the instructions. Okay, so we can actually um, use tar to create a single thing which can then be passed on. Or we can take that build and make that an output and pass that on. Um, which, which one is best? Okay, if the downstream activities from this build would benefit from having uh, the whole directory structure, then there's an argument to say, oh, use that. Okay. Um, it, it use the, pass the whole directory structure down, because there's no point creating a tarball, passing that on, and then having to expand that in order to get to the next step. Okay. Uh, if, however, the downstream activity is put this thing into an artifact repository, um, you know, as the product, then we should put it into a tarball. Um, because that's one you know, coherent lump blob, if you will. Uh, which can then be used during deployments and so on. Whereas keeping it as, as directories becomes more complicated because artifact repositories don't tend to deal well with things like directories. You know, they tend to want a thing. Uh, so tarballs are ideal. So the question becomes then, uh, what are we going to do now? Well, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add another step to run another Sphinx command, uh, another another one of the Sphinx commands. Uh, we're going to try doing the spell checking, uh, which is one of the tests we can do. So if we go to um, Sphinx document, uh, Sphinx document, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. uh, spell checking restricted things. Um, oh, that's a contributor. We don't necessarily want that. Oh, I'll tell you what we can check, uh, which is built in, which is the link checker. Um, um, link. Um, Um, and then, yeah. Let's just go into the So running build, blah 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 blah. I thought thought when I was mocking about with this earlier there was impulse pull check or link check or something you didn't need to install any third parties um, He's going to rub it up the wrong way.
Yeah, into Sphinx, we'll look at that at some point. Uh, utility. Nope. Builder. Mm. Oh, I should have I should have bookmarked it, shouldn't I? Okay. Well we forget that, but oh oh here you go. Builders link check. Dun 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 right. Uh Having this having the source code for it's a bit of an overkill. I don't particularly want to redo the source code. However, it's it's one of the builders, so uh, let's do um, configuration. Link check timeout, blah, 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 blah. Options for the link check builder. Okay. How do I invoke link check ignore? Oh, come on, it shouldn't be this difficult. This is obviously something we're going to put into conf.py, but I, I assume I can do just, let's just try it in here. Make uh, link dun, 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 dun. Oh, it's as simple as that. So there we go. Uh, HTML static path entry static does not exist. Oh, well, be expected because uh, we've got no static resources on our site yet. So, uh, but the good news is uh, we get build succeeded with one warning, and I assume uh, that it returns one and zero. Uh, the reason I ask that is because what we want to now do is write our tests and make link will be the first one to do the link check on the website. Um, so let's yeah, let's let's add this. Um, now we we could add it. Uh, I get out of here. We could add it to our existing script. Okay, so we could do make HTML and then we could immediately do make link check. But for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to create a new task called unit. Okay, so if I go to uh, go to the pipeline. Uh, hmm. Okay, so in the pipeline. Okay, so we want to create a new step in our plan, <coughs> um, and that's going to take uh, the output of this, um, uh, which means we have to specify an input. Okay, and we're then going to take it in as an input into the next step, as it were. And you know what? I'm going to leave it here because I've just realised that it's. Uh, 20 to 11 here. Right. I'm going to call it a day for now because uh, every, everything should be put away. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to play with this all yourself, then you can. Um, if you want to build it from scratch, uh, then you follow the instructions on the website, uh, and that will get you most of the way there. Uh, in fa in fact, 
let's be let's be super cool, shall we? Um, let's exit out of here. But I, mm, yeah, let's let's exit out of it. It makes it more obvious. Uh, we've got this. Um, Um, yeah, so we've got this scratch project. All right. Okay. Uh, which I've got out using this, but of course you will get it out using the HTTPS read only version. Um, so what we could do is we could add into actually exercise for the reader. There you go. Yeah. If you want something, if you want something to think about, yeah, look at the vagrant part. Okay. And you can see we run this bootstrap server provisioning. Uh, and if you look at, uh, the uh, the code in Bootstrap Server and in Lib, and I want you to add a step to that, which will, after it's got everything out, will start the process uh, by uh, cloning the repository, uh, and then if you really want to be ambitious, get it to clone the repository and also run the fly commands, which will uh initialize the pipeline uh yeah yeah that would be an interesting exercise uh so you you'd want to initialize the pipeline um for concourse to build this uh this project Uh, yeah, so to, yeah, okay. So yeah, so if you add that to Vagrant to actually get to this point where it's actually constructed, uh, uh, taken the thing out, and then to add the fly command. Uh, um, so that one. Uh, in order to, uh, yeah, initialize the fly, yeah, initialize fly, uh, uh, sorry, initialize concourse uh, and set it running. Bearing in mind, re remembering you have to do the fly minus t login first. Uh, so you have to do, uh, you'd have to, once you've done it, uh, the script would have to then do the, do the clone of the repository, run the fly login, run the fly set pipeline command, you also have to do one more thing if you want it to run automatically, and that is, uh, if you go to the pipelines, you'll see that you've got to, um, after you've set a pipeline, the pipeline will be paused. So you have to run this unpause pipeline command uh, in order to actually start it running. Okay. So uh, that will give you something to do. So you can build the virtual machine from the instructions, and then you can add in the next step in the provisioning, which is to do all of that. And I think I might do that, uh, although I'll probably do it tomorrow now. Yeah. All right, that's it. I'm 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 bushed, so uh, I'll call it a day, and I will see you next week, hopefully. <laughs>